This is Matamoros, an old Mexican border city in the state of Tamaulipas. To the north is the Rio Grande River, a metal fence in Brownsville, Texas. To the east is the Gulf of Mexico. To the west is the 2,000-mile U.S.-Mexican border. To the south, a continual stream of migrants from all over the world seeking passage to the United States. Some nefarious, but most simply searching for a better life. Matamoros is everything you've been led to believe that a Mexican border town is supposed to be. Old world charm, amazing street food, cheap pharmaceuticals, and the violence of fractured Mexican cartels competing for territory. Targeted killings, extortion, and kidnapping have become the norm. In fact, the entire state of Tamaulipas has gotten so bad that the U.S. State Department has issued a level four travel advisory. Do not travel. To put that into context, that's the same level the State Department has issued for Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. So naturally, that's where the current administration is forcing thousands of migrants and asylum seekers to wait for their chance to enter the U.S. legally. Here, in this makeshift refugee camp, where current estimates are that over 2,000 people are living with no help from the United States and minimal and sporadic help from the Mexican government. But they aren't alone. There's a growing army of volunteers that has formed to do what others wouldn't. Help. How did we get here? I don't mean that as a rhetorical question. I really wanted to know. I'm not part of the mainstream media. I'm a journalism professor and writer from one of the most conservative states in the country. And so I spent almost two years traveling down to the border to find out for myself. This is what I learned. I think that, that those two extremes divide us extremely and we close ourselves to understand the other. It builds people's ability, it builds their families, it builds their education. We have this country. Gotta share with other people. There's been any new staff hired at the courts? None. And you know they've gone from having, you know, three or four judges with a docket um, to having dockets that are, you know, over 350 people each day. You know, when I wore that uniform, I'm so proud. I was so proud, you know, uh, coming back from the war, I, I felt like a hero. Uh, and I, I just don't feel that way anymore. It's almost like, like I feel like, like we didn't do enough. There is a creek near my cabin that's most likely been flowing longer than human beings have walked these valleys. The Caddo and the Quapaw tribes walked these woods long before any European set foot here. And the more time I spend walking through these hills, the more I'm reminded of my place in the timeline of history. But this creek is older than they are. 
and its waters will continue to flow and cut and shape this valley long after I'm gone. The creek isn't large, and at first glance, it doesn't seem consequential. It's not big enough to fish, and in the summer, it often dries up. But a funny thing happened when they put a dam at the end of it. In the years before I was born, my grandfather worked for the government at the local soil conservation office. In those days, they were trying to repair the damage that had been done to the land in previous decades. Logging companies had cut too deep. Too many trees had been taken for lumber, leaving the ground exposed. Erosion was killing the soil, and the ecological fallout was massive. We thought we were stronger than nature. We were wrong. It took the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression to wake people up. But eventually they did, and so people like my grandfather began to work to make things right and rebuild what had been destroyed. One of the things they did was build this reservoir and several others like it. These watersheds reduced flooding in the valley caused by the runoff of rainwater from the mountains and provided enough fresh water for the local communities to survive during the toughest drought. They did it by giving the water a place to go. They protected the land and they protected the people by protecting the water. But that creek still flows and there's nothing anyone can do to stop it. These waters are a long way from Mexico. But over the past couple of years, I've watched the flow of migrants get bottlenecked at the southern border and I just can't help but think about that little creek by my cabin. You can no more stop the flow of people searching for better lives than you can stop the headwaters of a river. You can try to redirect it, but you can't make it go away. And so the border is kind of like a dam. But since we shut it down, we've created a larger problem. It's like we built a dam without also building a reservoir. We just stopped up the creek and ended up flooding the town and polluting the water. And that's not good for anyone. But maybe we can learn to think about the border from the perspective of a conservationist. Don't try to stop it. Instead, protect it. Give it a place to go. Give it a path that provides life for everyone. Now there are plenty of folks who want nothing to do with that idea, but there are also those who are trying to do just that. There's a myth that when disaster strikes, people turn against each other and it's every man for himself. But history doesn't agree with this belief. History shows time and time again that people come together, that people will help each other, and they will protect each other. They will become a watershed for their fellow man. Over the coming weeks, I'm going to be telling you about them, and I want you to hear their stories. I hope you'll listen.